so an hour less in bed. We're moving into British summer time, uh, but it doesn't feel much like summer winning of the new week on that weather front. Do gradually ease down 10 or even 20 degrees. So temperatures start to rise on north or southwest. The winds becoming lighter. And then later on in the week and across the country, so temperatures are going to drop. Those temperatures drop away during the second half of the weekend. In time for the Easter weekend, temperatures will be close to what we're seeing today, which is a little bit below par for the time of year. Real up and down sort of journey, but make the most of that sunshine and the warmth if you can, you too. Will do, Darren. And, and, and as far as the ups are concerned, those temperatures in some places, mid-20s on Tuesday, Wednesday. I mean, how yep. unusual is that for this time of year? The record temperature, I think, in March is 25.6. And that's coming off the bit of the top <laughs> of my head. Uh, there's not a lot there. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> but, you know, it does happen in March. But what we do, this is transition sort of time. And you see big differences in temperatures. So this is quite normal what we're seeing. But, you know, this is going to come as a nice surprise. Very good. We see the steam almost rising from your head as you come up with that, but it's actually cloud. Uh, thank you very much indeed. See you later. But you know, as long as it's dry yeah, the Easter weekend, that's, that's the thing. It doesn't really matter if it's cold. It's just... Let's get the out. rain we don't. Yeah, exactly. We don't want. Now, on Monday, for the first time in 12 weeks, people across England will be no longer ordered to stay at home. Many outdoor activities can resume. Of course... In Wales, that's happening from today anyway. It is from this morning. We know that uh, lots of people in Wales are already out there. We've got zero audience in Wales this morning, I suspect. Uh, it's all the next step in the different government's roadmaps out of lockdown after children return to school, of course. And although there has been a slight increase in infection levels in secondary school age children, overall, the percentage of people testing positive does seem to be levelling off, doesn't yeah. seem to be not that much of an uptick at the moment. No, 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 quite, um, given that we've had that bit of opening up. Let's talk to our Saturday morning regulars, virologist Dr Chris Smith and Professor of Public Health Linda Bald. As ever, a delight to see you both this Saturday morning. morning. I suppose the big story of the morning really is about these COVID booster jabs. And um, we've had a question from our audience um, in relation to that. So Jeff has asked this on Twitter. Uh, he wants to find out if the vaccination programme is going to be for the foreseeable future with vaccines constantly adjusted to fight new variants. So, Chris, is this the future? Is this just the, the way we're going to have to get used to things and living with this virus? Yeah, morning, Rachel. Yes, I think it is, at least for the, an endemic infection. We're not going to get rid of this at any time in the near future. So we have to plan to live alongside it and to control it. And the best way to do that is with vaccines to approach this. And, and Chris, can I ask as well, is it sensible that it's just going to be the over 70s and those most vulnerable groups, given that we're making a big effort at the moment to vaccinate every adult? Well, we know that this is not an equal opportunities virus, don't we? In that most of the most severe impacts have been focused on a particular sector of society and that's vulnerable to catching the infection. Uh, we've got a question here from Anthony, Linda, a question for you. Uh, of course, this time last year, it was all about washing your hands, wasn't it? Uh, we weren't even wearing masks uh, at this point a year ago. But Anthony asks, have we now identified the most common way that COVID is spread? Linda, what... What should we be thinking most about now, 12 months on? Morning, John. Well, we should definitely all still be washing our hands, but we do know much more about this virus now and how it spreads. The main way it spreads is through close contact between individuals and that, um, that are inhaled or land on the mucous membranes that line our noses or our mouths. Um, and that's the way the virus comes into contact in our bodies with our cells. Um, it's also, though, really importantly, something that we knew much less about earlier on in the pandemic is it's airborne. So you can have tiny droplets or small particles suspended in the air, potentially for some time. And that's how other um, respiratory diseases pass on, tuberculosis, for example, and also other infections like measles are passed on through airborne transmission. Other, the virus has been in the air. Surfaces, fomites, touching those we don't think is a main route of transmission, although it certainly is not ruled out. So I guess two messages there. Um, the distancing remains very important and the face coverings are even more important. And probably most important, actually, is if we're indoors, make sure we're in a well-ventilated space. But Linda, that's obviously why the focus is very much on, as we open up, outdoor activities and socialising. So just some, some sort of helpful practical advice, please, for people watching this morning who are either now this weekend in Wales or elsewhere next week in other parts of the country, preparing to have people in their back gardens. Are there any measures you should put in place 
And what about if they need to use the loo in your house? How can you make that COVID secure? Or should you be saying, go and find a quiet corner of the garden somewhere? <laughs> I don't know. You're not coming to my house, Rachel. House, Rachel. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> that's a good point. Um, <laughs> Probably not the latter, actually, no. So I think uh, it's really important to do everything we can outdoors. And of course, up here in Scotland, we've already been able to restart group sports outdoors that are non-contact, which has been brilliant for so many people and really delighted to see what's happening in Wales. I think if somebody's coming in um, to visit you in your garden and does need to go through the house, try and minimise the duration of time they're in the property. If they are visiting the toilet, just make sure um, that that's cleaned. If you can, ideally make sure the person using it is cleaning the surfaces and, and, and just giving the things a wipe down, make sure you've got some cleaning things there. It's not an invitation for everybody to be embracing, even though we'd love to do that for the relatives and friends we've not seen. So still distancing outdoors. And the old things like if you're having a picnic in the back garden, even though surfaces are not the main route transmission trying to avoid sharing cutlery and those kinds of things i think worth taking it out taking it off when you when you go outdoors yeah okay thanks that's helpful it might just be useful just to have a packet of those wipes you know yeah, yeah. In, in the loo for wiping oh, down oh. handles and taps and that kind of thing I, i'd always the plants in your garden grow so well <laughs> and now it's uh, don't worry i've all, got a very strong bladder John. You don't have anything to worry about. Uh, chris i've got a question here for you from jean side effect after getting the vaccine uh, nothing at all. Uh, she said she didn't even get a, a experience a sore arm. And we're told that, you know, the side effects are a sign that, that, that it's all working. So should she be worried that it's it's not working for her? No, Jean shouldn't be worried at all. A straw poll among the, my uh, doctor friends who have had these vaccines reveals that about half of people have some side effects and about half don't. In the studies, which show comprehensively the vast majority of people after a few weeks have antibodies, regardless of whether they had side effects or not. So when your immunity builds up, I know you need the second jab and it's a couple of weeks after that that you get the maximum protection. But you know, how, how protected is somebody after two days, two weeks? Well, when you are exposed to either an infection for real or a vaccine, the immune system kicks in and begins to build a response. And in the same way as you don't magic up a house and have a house instantly, it takes a few weeks to lay the foundations, put the brickwork in, put the windows in, put the roof on. The immune system is exactly the same. You're building an immune response, which involves making lots of new cells, making antibodies, and then maturing that response. It's about revision and refining the response. So it's as good and precise and specific as it can be. And the same is true for things like flu vaccines. But by three weeks, that, that response is really very mature. So 12 weeks later, it consolidates that protection and also helps to bring up to the line of protection people who might not have responded adequately to the first dose. But his partner had it three days earlier and was unwell for a day. And he asked, do women suffer more adverse effects? Do we know anything, any data around side effects of vaccines for this particular one, Linda? That's a very good question from Keith, actually, because this is, is being discussed. As, as we've heard from the last question from Jean, some women, of course, don't have any um, adverse effects or any symptoms afterwards. But what you see in the literature is some really interesting things. Now, there's a couple of explanations. The first one may be reporting, so biological mechanisms. Women tend to mount a stronger immune response, particularly younger women. We also know that autoimmune diseases like MS, for example, rheumatoid arthritis, are more common in women. The ability uh, of new variants come coming into the country. What was the latest on, on that, particularly uh, that South African variant that we understand might not be so uh, uh, good with our vaccines we have already? Well, all viruses mutate and change, and this coronavirus is no exception. And we're very lucky in this country because we have COG UK. This is a consortium, a network of laboratories across the country that are actually screening the positive test samples and reading the genetic code variant which has actually now spread to Europe and is accounting for what Europe is calling its third wave. So we do have a radar screen and we're able to spot where these changes are happening and to what parts of the virus and therefore make predictions about how that might affect the behaviour of the virus. This is in turn being fed back to people who are involved and engaged in making vaccines and updating vaccines. And that's why, for instance, Nadim Zahawi has said there's a plan to have a booster dose for Sonablus to be responsive and agile around if there are variants, because what we do know is, although the vaccines do appear to work against many of these variants... And the other big sort of story around vaccines this week has been discussion around vaccine passports or vaccine certificates then being deployed, not just in travel, but maybe in the world of hospitality and other big events. And well, because we don't know if the vaccine really significantly prevents transmission, 
why do we need a certification potentially to go and stand next to someone in the pub if you've been vaccinated? Well, Rachel, I think we are beginning to see some evidence that the vaccines do reduce transmission. We've had several studies that we've talked about in recent weeks uh, from up here from Scotland, another study from, from Cambridge, etc. So there's really promising evidence on that, although it's not definitive. I think we are probably going to see some kind of certification program. Israel rolled out its green pass that I think this, the pressure is going to be on, particularly when we get to bigger events later in the year. But even just to get back into some venues, we may need to do that. But there are big concerns about inequalities. It needs to be something I think that would be rolled out perhaps once everybody's been offered a vaccine. Um, and it needs to be done carefully and accessibly. So between countries, if there's got to be some uh, proof of vaccine status or a recent test. Talking this morning about getting back out into the into the outdoor world and enjoying nature. I, I feel like I'm in the outdoor world looking at your offices today because you've got all those flowers. Going inside, <laughs> like a couple of greenhouses. They look stunning. And, you know, last week we had uh, one of our viewers got in touch and uh, showed us that picture of of Chris that she'd made brilliantly out of recycled materials. This, well, we, we, this, we suggested that Linda had been left out. Yes. So this week we have this amazing piece of artwork which I think is mm. fabulous, complete with the flowers of Linda. And there's another one. Wow, Linda, it's like looking to the mirror. Well, it's really nice because I got sent these and I was so delighted. And um, it's just very, very thoughtful of people. If you think about the time and effort they put into that, both the one last week of Chris and these. Um, so, yeah, absolutely delighted. And it's just a really nice thing. Uh, it sounds like Chris has got extra flowers. I'm obviously concerned and distressed about that. I did just well, try and get You know an what extra you need? Color. You need his funky clock because so many people, Chris, are absolutely in love yeah. with your virus clock and are mesmerised well, well, by it. And I don't yeah. want, like to talk about it because I don't want it to distract from what you're saying. No, no, but um, th this is the COVID clock. And when this clock ticks, you'll see it adds extra spikes to the outer coat of the virus. So every two seconds, we get a new spike. I've actually got a variant of the clock, the B117 <laughs> clock, which adds twice as many spikes every time it ticks. Of but no, I just thought it'd be have. a bit of fun. Of course you have, Chris. We're going to try and turn this into a Naked Scientist screensaver. So you'll be able to download the Naked Scientist COVID clock uh, in, in the future. We're working on it right now. So maybe stay tuned for next week and I'll see what I can do. <gasps> Oh, such excitement. <laughs> I think Chris has been using Rachel's fertiliser on his plants, but uh, <laughs> hopefully not. Guys, thank you so much uh, for joining it's us this pleasure. Saturday. I'm sure we'll see you again next week. Uh, thanks for making that clear and fun and interesting. And it's time to take a look ahead now to what... It's going to be clear, fun and interesting. <laughs> and as usual, Ted. OK, brilliant. We'll see you then. Make it fun and interesting, OK? We were. <laughs> <laughs> no, we were. And you need we a were. clock. <laughs> I know, I love that clock. We get some, like, yes. maybe some wooden spoons or something that go around the clock face. Yeah. No, I want, I want a virus clock. <laughs> a little bit dark. I think that might put people off the food. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> right, coming up on the show. It is